Hi, I'm Peter Cavanna, and thank you for joining me as we have a little think about the epistles to the Thessalonians. Uh, why don't you turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 17. Acts and the 17th chapter. While you're finding that, let me explain something. Um, when I was uh, teaching the New Testament at college or seminary, uh, I would teach the Gospels first, as you might expect, and I would add Acts because you can connect that with 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 Luke, of course, because of the authorship and because uh, of the uh, connected themes. But then I would jump to First and Second Thessalonians, sometimes Galatians, but but quite often. 1 and 2 Thessalonians. And the reason for it was not because I just like doing things out of order. Everyone was expecting Romans, of course. But it's because I find it helpful to try as best as we can to approach the New Testament in some kind of chronological order. Not by the order of the books in the English Bible, but by by our very best guess, the chronological order in which they were written. By and large, the order of the books in your New Testament and mine in English is kind of decided by length. So you find that the longer books come first, like Paul's letters, right? And then as, the, as Paul's letters get shorter, so they get pushed towards the end. And so that is sort of mostly how the order in our English Bible has come about. So I want to uh, tackle First and Second Thessalonians early on in our in our lecture series because they were very possibly uh, written early on in the life of the early church for reasons that, of course, we're going to talk about in our lecture. So have you found Acts 17 yet? I hope you have. The reason I've started here in Acts is because here Luke records the planting of the Thessalonian church. Paul arrives in Thessalonica, there in verse 1, where there was a Jewish synagogue. Thessalonica was the uh, capital city of Macedonia. Uh, maybe 200,000 people living there, um, an important seaport city. And so if you, if you remember, in Acts 16, Paul receives a call, a visionary call from the man of Macedonia. Come over to Macedonia and help us. And so the apostolic group set off to go to Macedonia. And, of course, they go to Philippi, and there's a whole lot of adventures that they have there. But, of course, they are primarily perhaps heading for Thessalonica. It's the capital city. It's a bit like if God called you from across the world to come to England. You might think that preaching in London might be a good idea, at least at some point. And so that's what's happening here. Paul has arrived at the capital and uh, there's a Jewish synagogue there. Verse 2, read it with me. As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue and on three uh, Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. Verse 4, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. So, so just remember that for a little bit later. The converts were some of the Jews some of the Greeks, Thessalonica is a Greek city, and uh, a few of the prominent women. That's 
uh, one of Luke's themes, you may remember, is always to take note uh, of where women are involved in the in the activities um, of the church. Now, upon reading this, it would seem like Paul was only in Thessalonica maybe for three weeks or for three Sabbaths. But we're not sure about that. There could be a gap, if you like, between verse 4 and verse 5. And there may be a reason to believe there's maybe a gap, which I'll talk about in a moment. So verse 5, which might be a few weeks later. But the Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying there's another king called Jesus. And when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they put Jason and the others on bail and let them go. And then verse 10, as soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. So a very, very uh, traumatic trip full of uh, uh, action, i.e. persecution and trouble. And so let's think about the origins of this wonderful um, epistle. Why do we think that maybe Paul was in Thessalonica longer than the three Sabbath days that we read about here in the early part of Acts 17. Well, there are one or two reasons for that. Paul talks in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9, and in, in that area there, in those verses, how hard he worked, that he, that he worked hard, he toiled day and night and didn't want to be a burden. And, and, and he talks about how he, how he shared his life with the uh, Thessalonians. Now, of course, you can share your life and work hard and make an impact in three weeks, you know, maybe four, of course. Um, you can make an impact in a month. And so maybe Paul just was uh, uh, very busy during those three weeks. But there's another reference, and it's in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 16, where Paul writing to the Philippians, which you may recall is the church that he had founded and started just before he uh, gets to here in Acts 17. So Acts 16 is Philippi, Acts 17 is uh, Thessalonica and Berea and then Athens, and then Acts 18 is when he arrives at Corinth. But in Philippians, he writes to them and says this, that they had sent him while he was in Thessalonica, that they had sent him aid again and again. Philippians 4 and verse 16. Now, the idea that they had sent him aid again and again, again, may suggest that there is a longer period that Paul is in Thessalonica. And so that little gap between verses 4 and verse 5 may well exist. Who knows? But this is uh, a record of the establishing um, of that church. And however long it was that Paul was there, persecution came, there was trouble, and uh, and Paul and Silas leave. They, they have to flee, really, because of the riot that's been caused in the city. Um, why don't we turn to 1 Thessalonians and chapter 2, and then we begin to pick up a bit of the story of uh, what this first epistle is really all about. Um, 
it's believed that First Thessalonians and actually Second Thessalonians is written from Corinth. So Paul has gone from Philippi, Acts 16, to Thessalonica, Acts 17, one or two adventures in Acts 17 as well. But then Acts 18 arrives in Corinth. And it says in Acts 18 that while Paul is at Corinth, that he stayed in Corinth for 18 months, uh, teaching them the word of God. That's Acts 18, uh, verse 5, and then verses 9 through to 13. And so it is believed that during that 18-month period that you can read about in Acts 18, while at Corinth, Paul writes 1 Thessalonians. And what has happened is this, that, of course, you'll, you'll recall, Paul left Thessalonica uh, in the middle of trouble and his pastoral heart uh, and uh, empathetic concern for them was strong. He, he was aware that he'd had to sort of leave them and there'd been trouble. And so he didn't want to, you know, change his missionary plans. This is his second missionary journey recorded in Acts. So he, he didn't really want to change his plans. He wanted to preach in Corinth. He wanted to go on to Ephesus. And so he sends Timothy on a kind of a, I don't know, a secret mission, but certainly a mission that didn't involve Paul anyway, to go back to Thessalonica and just to see how things were, how was the lie of the land. And so that's where we pick up our reading. Why don't you turn to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and uh, verse 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 17. Let me greatly encourage you to see all this in your Bible. Paul writes this, and I'm reading from the NIV. You may have something similar. But, brothers, he says, when we were torn away from you for a short time in person not in thought out of our intense longing we made every effort to see you for we wanted to come to you certainly I Paul did again and again uh, but Satan stopped us fascinating First, Paul doesn't explain at all what he means by that. For what is our hope? Is it not you, Paul goes on to say. So then, chapter 3 and verse 1. So when we could stand it no longer, <laughs> we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. And we sent Timothy, who is our, our brother and God's fellow worker, in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith. So, although Paul writes this in Corinth, he's remembering that it was at Athens that he sent Timothy back to Thessalonica just to see how they were doing. Um, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. Notice that. Can you see that in your Bible? That he doesn't want them to be unsettled by the trials. He was aware that there had been uh, great trials during his time with them. If you look at chapter 1 and uh, look at verse 6, uh, Paul mentions there about the, the suffering that they all endured as a result of him preaching the gospel to them. Okay. Uh, in fact, verse 4, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. Hmm. And it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, says Paul, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you and our efforts might have been useless or in vain. But... Verse 6, da, 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 da. good news is coming now. Timothy has just come to us from you and has brought good news 
about your faith and love. He's told us that you have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers, see this in your Bible here, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. So the purpose of First Thessalonians is very clear. Paul's concerned that the church that he had maybe not abandoned but fled the scene because of the riot, because of the difficulty that we read about in Acts. He's been concerned for them and Timothy has returned from there to Paul in Corinth in Acts 18 to say, Paul, they're doing okay. Uh, they're still going on with the Lord. And Paul, as a result, writes this, uh, this wonderful um, epistle. And it's wonderful in many ways because it could be, it could be the very first of the uh, epistles of the Apostle Paul. It could be. Why might we think that? Well, turn in your Bible to Acts 18 and there are one or two answers to that question. Acts 18 and uh, I want you to see verse 12. It says this, while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul. Now, just stop there. While Gallio was the proconsul of Achaia. That is a wonderful piece of historical information. I want you to imagine that you are researching something and, and you want to know when such a thing occurred. Imagine if while you're doing that research, it says something like this. In the year that Queen Elizabeth II celebrated her 85th birthday, such and such a thing happened. You think, wow, I can work that out. I can know when Queen Elizabeth II was born. I can work out when her 85th birthday was. And therefore, I can work out exactly, or almost exactly, to a year when this occurred. Well, we know for sure that Gallio was proconsul of Achaia at a certain time in history. Now, we can't know it exactly, but we can know that it's around 51 or 52 AD. We know this, by the way, because of a little record written by uh, the Roman Emperor Claudius uh, complimenting his friend Gallio, the proconsul, which was found at the Temple of Apollo. And, uh, and so we can date this uh, period of time. In fact, it's, some scholars think this is the strongest uh, piece of evidence to, to precisely date you know, a period of the New Testament, certainly in the life of Paul. We can be very approximate about dates when it comes to Paul and Peter and various other New Testament characters. But a date like this is just wonderful. So, so this would mean that 1 Thessalonians was probably written about 50 AD. May have been 49, may have been 50, but somewhere around there. And because... 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians are very similar. They have very similar themes. They are motivated similarly, i.e. there's a reason for writing them that is very, very similar. It's genuinely believed that 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians are written about six months apart. So one is written and then a few months later, the next one is written, both of them from Corinth. And so we're looking... Uh, in this lecture at perhaps the earliest piece 
of the New Testament that still exists, at least, uh, that we still have that was written. And so that makes First Thessalonians quite an exciting epistle. Now, there is some competition. Some people think it might be Galatians. Some people think it might be James. And, of course, we'll deal with those in due course. So what is this letter all about? Paul, unable to come to Thessalonica himself. He wanted to. It's ironic, isn't it? It says Satan stopped him. And so, of course, what would you do if you can't get there? Well, you'd have to write a letter. And so whatever Satan's plans were for the apostle, in fact, whatever the satanic strategy was, it actually implemented or or was the catalyst for the writing of New Testament epistles. Glory to God. So I, I don't think the devil had the last laugh on that one. So what is this epistle about and what are these epistles about? Number one, persecutions. Now, let's turn to Second Thessalonians just to pick up this theme. We already read a little bit about this in the first epistle, as you saw. But Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verses 3 to 7 uh, would probably be a good reading at this at this time. Um, look what Paul says. Again, remember, this is perhaps written six months later. And so it's still in the same general season of time as the first epistle. Not much has changed, I guess. Paul writes, we always ought to thank God for you, brothers. And rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more. And the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. Mm. And so not much had changed, had it, between the first and the second letter. All this is evidence, Paul says in verse 5, that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. It's very interesting to me that New Testament writers don't explain away suffering. They don't suggest that Christians should be immune from it or even sometimes even delivered of it. But rather... The persecution is a sign from God of the of the worthiness of those being persecuted, that they will enter the kingdom of God. God is just, he says. He will pay back trouble, verse 6, for those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. And this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire. Notice that too, that when Paul promises that there will be relief, he isn't talking about in the normal span of time. He means when Jesus returns, there will be relief. And perhaps in Paul's mind, not actually before then. Another reason why Paul writes to them is to encourage them in the whole area of godly living. Uh, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and we'll look at the first seven verses there. Do you remember that I asked you to take note that the converts that Paul had, uh, recorded by Luke, there were perhaps others, but the ones Luke recorded, we saw that there were Gentiles, didn't we, among the converts. Now, you must grasp when you think about the New Testament and you think about the New Testament world, that often, maybe not all the time, but often the general morality of the Jews might be considered to be reasonably high. Okay, There were certain standards regarding for example, sexual immorality. 
Whereas in the Greek world, there was a little bit of anything goes. And Thessalonica, of course, was quite near Mount Olympus and a place uh, famed. You, you may know or you may not know that uh, quite a bit of Greek religion uh, and idolatry uh, could quite often involve shrine prostitution and and sort of there was a connection between sexuality and religion sometimes in certain uh, quarters of the Greek philosophical and religious world. And so and so Gentiles may not have been, uh, what should we say, so accustomed to some of the moral standards that perhaps were to be expected among those that were attending the Jewish synagogue. So while, of course, Paul is trying to make converts of these Jews, from Judaism to Christianity, quite a lot of the, um, you know, Judaism and its um, morality wouldn't have been too different to the kinds of things that Paul was preaching about. But for the Greeks, for the Gentiles, sometimes, what shall we say, they might have a little bit of catching up to do. Do you know what I mean? And so this is what we sometimes read about. So, First Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, Paul writes this, Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. And look at verse 3, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. Well, that's true. If ever you said, Lord, what is your will for me? Well, there's a good verse. <laughs> it's God's will that we should be sanctified. But then Paul unpacks it a little more specifically and perhaps, perhaps because of his Gentile audience. Um, this sanctification, what does it mean? That you should avoid sexual immorality, that you should learn to control your own body in a way that's holy and honorable okay not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know god and in this matter no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him uh, verse 7 for god did not call us to be impure but to live a holy life and so you find this in these in these um, epistles an injunction to live a, a holy life, particularly in the shadow of the pagan heathenism that perhaps Mount Olympus might have represented for many of these folks. And then there's another theme that's in both epistles, but we'll have a look in 2 Thessalonians 3. 2 Thessalonians 3, and just picking up in verse 6, the theme of idleness. Paul seems to be aware that one of the burning issues in Thessalonica in the church, and maybe Timothy was the one that conveyed this information, that would seem likely, logical, was that there was a certain idleness um, about these folks. Um, he says this, verse 6, are you with me? 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle. Now, it's not the first time he's mentioned this. He mentions this in the first epistle. When you read through it, you'll you'll see that there. Keep away from every brother who is idle, who doesn't live according to the teaching you received from us. Uh, for you yourselves know uh, how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you. Remember I said Paul... Uh, talks a lot about how hard they work well part of it was to uh, you know part of the reason of of conveying that information at least was to show them how they ought to be he says we weren't idle when we were with you nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it on the contrary we worked night and day laboring and toiling so that we wouldn't be a burden to you we did this not because we didn't have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you 
to follow. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. We hear that some among you, verse 11, are idle. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Such people we urge you in the name of Jesus. Uh, we urge them to settle down and earn the bread they eat. As for you, brothers, never tire of doing what is right. So maybe there was uh, some news that had come to Paul that there was uh, a certain lethargy and laziness among some of the folks in the church and he wants to address that. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you don't particularly hear sermons on idleness uh, too often. Not in the circles I've been in anyway. One of the reasons for that idleness could well be connected to the third and the final uh, main theme of these epistles, the return of Jesus. Why don't you turn in your Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, in 1 Thessalonians and in 2 Thessalonians, the issue of the return of Jesus and clarity over this, uh, this amazing event was required. There had been certain uh, misunderstandings, misconceptions, and in 2 Thessalonians, uh, we read that some dodgy teaching in the form of a prophetic word uh, had arrived at the church. Anyway, we'll get to that in just a moment. In 1 Thessalonians and uh, chapter 4, we we pick up the theme of the return of Jesus and the, the great misunderstanding that had occurred in the church. It was clear that in the first century, that the imminent return of Jesus was very much in the minds of Christians, much, much more than it is now. In fact, today, it, it could be argued that if Jesus were to return today, quite a few Christians would be fairly annoyed that they weren't able to live out some wonderful predestined plan that God had for them or things that they wanted to do. We seem to have drifted away from the supremacy of the return of Christ a little. Anyway, I'll get off that. In the first century, it was believed that Jesus would absolutely return in the lifetime of those who heard the gospel. We, of course, have the benefit of 2,000 years of reflection and, and time to look back and say, well, the coming of the Lord is imminent, but we know that it hasn't occurred in the last 2,000 years. But they lived in a in an environment, an atmosphere, if you like, of great anticipation that Jesus would return and take his people to be with him in the kingdom of God. Now, just imagine this. Someone in the church dies. Either old age, illness, whatever it may have been. And people in the church at Thessalonica died. And there was a real fear among the congregation, maybe even the leaders as well, I don't know, that these people were now lost. That in order to enter the kingdom of God, you had to still be alive when Jesus came. Now, this may sound like nonsense to us, but can you imagine a first century church believing this, that Jesus is going to come any time to take us to be with himself and then people were dying. Oh no, they're not going to enter the kingdom of God. Things have gone horribly wrong for them. And Paul writes to absolutely put the record straight. And we're going to read it now. Have you found First Thessalonians 4 and verse 13? Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant, he says, about those who fall asleep. That's a uh, uh, an expression used by Paul quite a lot for those who have died. But it perhaps is more than a, an expression. It sort of reflects the way Paul thinks about those who have died, that they haven't really died, uh, but they simply await a greater resurrection. So 
He says, I don't want to be to be ignorant, he says, about those who've died or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. He says, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. That's amazing. So, so in other parts of the New Testament, as we know, Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so when a Christian died, as far as Paul was concerned, they went immediately to be with the Lord. And here Paul says that Jesus will bring all these people back with him when he returns. God will bring with Jesus all those who have fallen asleep in him those who have died as part of the christian faith verse 15 according to the lord's own word and by the way this is probably paul referencing new testament literature so whenever paul is saying according to what the lord has said he's probably not talking about a personal revelation to him he's probably talking about uh, the scriptures that uh, uh, were being uh, developed and and the and the oral tradition of the of the passing on of Jesus' own words. So anyway, that's a fascinating study all by itself. So all I'm saying is he's not talking about a personal prophecy he's had here or a personal revelation. He means according to the things that we know Jesus said. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive. Did you spot the we? Paul expected to be alive at the time of the coming of the Lord. Who are left until the coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. He says it's not going to be an advantage to be alive. We're not going to go first. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So, in fact, they get sort of preferential treatment. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever so paul is saying don't worry about those who are dying they're going to come back from the dead it's very interesting this whole thing about about imminence of the of the coming of the lord in chapter 5 very reminiscent of luke uh, chapter 12 and uh, verses 39 and and 40 this idea that the lord is going to come like a thief in the night first thessalonians 5 and verse 2. Um, but I want you to notice verse 4. But you brothers, he says, you're not in darkness that this day should surprise you like a thief. And so there's a sense in which Paul is saying that Christians shouldn't really be surprised when the Lord comes. This whole idea about Jesus coming like a thief in the night, all that means in New Testament terms is that it will be a surprise. No one expects a thief. That's that's the metaphor that's being used here. It's not to do with a rapture or something like that. It is simply that it's going to be a surprise. And Paul goes on to say, but you, sort of if you like, you're expecting the thief. You'll know when he's going to come. And this is further unpacked in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Why don't you turn there with me? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now remember, we're about six months later in the timeline of Paul's life and in their, in their lives. And in between the writing of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, some dodgy teaching has got in concerning 
He says in chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1, are you, are you with me? Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled, he says, or alarmed by some prophecy, report or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. So their first problem was they were worried about people who had died, that they weren't going to be saved. Now they've heard that the Lord has come and that they uh, had no part in his coming. Well, both things are, of course, completely wrong. Now, what Paul's going to do here is something quite extraordinary. Paul's going to unpack a little a little bit like uh, the book of Revelation in a way. Paul's going to unpack a little bit of the timeline of events that will precede the coming of Jesus. And that the Thessalonians are supposed to look for these signs, which suggests, by the way, that they're not going to be raptured out of it, but they're still going to be there on earth to be able to witness them. Would you agree? So he says this, um, these th these things that the coming of the Lord and are being gathered together to him won't come. And then he lists a whole load of things which we're going to read through now. Don't let anyone deceive you. That's not going to happen until, verse 3, the, now I've got here, the, the rebellion occurs, the apostasy. So Paul says that there's going to be a turning away from the faith. Now, don't get cross with me now. Do you promise not to get cross with me? Do you promise? Okay. Many preachers say that before the Lord comes again, we should expect there to be a phenomenal revival. Now, that may well be the case after all. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And so maybe there will be a phenomenal move of the Holy Spirit before the coming of the Lord. And, and I pray that's so, and I, I'd love to think that that will happen. However, have you got your seatbelt on? If that does occur, wonderful though that will be, actually what we read here, is that there will be a turning away from the faith before the coming of the Lord. And anyone who's read the book of Revelation, even just once, will be able to know that that's the case, that people turn away from the faith rather than turn to the faith before the end of time. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, doesn't he, that in the last days, uh, there will be terrible times. People will love themselves and and uh, people will mock God. And, you know, anyway, there's a whole load of these things in the New Testament. So, so Paul begins to spell out for the Thessalonians before the coming of the Lord, there will be a rebellion. There will be a great apostasy that may infer there'd have to be a great revival first, I suppose. So I guess both things could be true. And then... The man of lawlessness is revealed. Um, sometimes I like to think of this character as the as the anarchist. So in in the letters of John, you have the antichrists. In the book of Revelation, you have the beasts. Well, here I like to use the phrase anarchist. Now, the word anarchist uh, perhaps is helpful, perhaps unhelpful. If you think that anarchist means someone who does not respect law, has no law. And that's literally what the word uh, in the Greek is here. Animos. There is no law in this person. He is a he is an anarchist, someone who does not accept rules of any kind. The man of lawlessness. And Paul says he's the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. 
just a little thought for you here. When Paul wrote the word temple there, uh, Paul perhaps wouldn't have been aware that the, the actual Jewish temple was going to be destroyed. And so when Paul writes temple, the Jewish temple in Jerusalem is what he has in mind, rather than being figurative for the church or something like that. And then he says this in verse 5, don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. And so it's interesting that talk on the end times was, was a feature of Paul's teaching while he was at Thessalonica. And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the at the proper time. And then verse 7, very, very odd verse. No one really knows what this verse means. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. There is some sort of restraining influence that 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 although the secret power of lawlessness is at work the the uh, demonic powers are at work yet this particular satanic individual and yes i do think it's the same person m mentioned in revelation 13 uh, that somehow there's a power holding back the coming of this individual and then at some point that power uh, that's restraining him will be removed and it's so so mysterious and Paul isn't very clear about what he means at all he goes on to say that the coming of the lawless one verse 9 will be in accordance with you know satanic strategy and there'll be all sorts of lying signs and wonders that will accompany this um, individual and he'll deceive those who are perishing and they perish, Paul says, because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. For this reason, verse 11, God sends them a powerful delusion so they will believe the lie. It reminds me a little of Romans 1, where because of the sinfulness of humankind, God gives them over to a depraved mind but the good news is look back at verse 8 the lawless one will be revealed whom the lord jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming so interesting to me that in these early epistles of the new testament there is so much eschatology being mentioned and we've got that infuriating part where paul says things like don't you remember when i was with you that i that i mentioned this in other words there are things that he taught them that he doesn't exactly mention here so these early early epistles are just so wonderful let's look at one more verse in them as we close first thessalonians now chapter one and uh, I want to look at just the last couple of verses as we close off our, our lecture. The theme of the second coming actually is all the way through the first epistle. If you look, every chapter of First Thessalonians, now the chapters weren't written by Paul, of course, they weren't put in by Paul. But the way the chapters uh, end in First Thessalonians, every time they finish with some talk or reflection, on the second coming but first thessalonians chapter 1 and uh, verses 9 and 10 are of great interest to me and we will we'll conclude by looking at these they tell how you turned to god from idols he's reflecting on what happened when he was there in act 17 you turned to god from idols that's that that's evidence of a Greek audience for you again, right? The, the Jewish people in the synagogue didn't have idols, but it seems like the overwhelming uh, uh, constituents of the, those who were converted uh, 
uh, were idol worshippers, you see. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. One more reflection for you is this. One of the great explorations of the New Testament is the exploration for the gospel itself. What was the original gospel message? And if you had a look at our lecture on Acts, then we took a little bit of time just to talk about this, or at least introduce the idea that in Acts there are speeches that seem to contain the early gospel message. Scholars call it the charigma, the first original gospel message. But here's something a bit special. If First Thessalonians is written in about 50 AD, and we talked about why that might be the case, then First Thessalonians is the earliest written record of the gospel message itself. Here in verses 9 and 10. What was the first gospel? Well, it was this. To turn to God from idols. To serve the living and true God. Note the word serve is inserted there. In the gospel, people serve the true and living God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. The resurrection is a huge uh, element of the first gospel. Jesus, he says, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Maybe in those two verses, verse and a half actually, we have the very first written record of the gospel. Oh, these Thessalonian epistles, they are really, really special. 